Right, so now we're started. It seems that you know quite a bit about this already. And it's always good to sort of sum up our prior knowledge before we start on the lecture. Um, I will start with a few uh, pieces of information compiled by Eurostat, the uh, statistics office of the European Commission. So this uh, first slide uh, are meant to illustrate the state of affairs with respect to transport and the environment in, the, in Europe. These are the, well, not all of them, but most of the objectives, the policy aims of the EU related to what they call sustainable transport. And the first one uses a slightly odd word called de decoupling of economic growth and demand for transport. This comes from the fact that uh, when the demand for transport increases normally uh, no, sorry, Nor the, uh, when the economy increases or, or grows, then the demand for transport will also grow. And uh, we'll see some statistics that illustrate how this is related. The aim of the EU is, is to sort of have economic growth without having uh, an equal growth of the transport volumes. Reducing transport greenhouse gas emissions, obviously, um, an important bit. And then other pollutant emissions that has effects on human health or the environment. They say that they want a balanced shift towards environmentally friendly transport modes, but they don't say which mode this is, and that would be dependent on the, the situation. Reducing noise, uh, which is a su significant problem in, in congested areas, urban areas. Uh, and then some aims related to passenger transport, which we don't deal with here. And then they want for passenger cars to reduce the average CO2 emissions of the cars um, down to 130 grams per kilometer in 2015 and 95 grams in 2020. This last aim may be uh, revised. There were some rumors now uh, that they may postpone this to 2023 or something. And behind that is the car manufacturers of the European Union. They, especially the German ones, they don't want to have an ambitious goal for this because they build larger cars than in Southern Europe and have bigger problems with that. Okay, the first aim then is to decouple transport and energy use from economic growth. This graph is meant to illustrate that. And uh, we can focus only on the, the light yellow one here, and uh, which illustrates energy consumption from transport as a proportion of the economy, gross domestic product. So does this mean that they have they tried to, uh, have they achieved this decoupling thing? If you look at this, this graph here, is this an indicator that decoupling of transport growth from economic growth is actually happening? Or is it not? Has the policy been successful, judging from the development from the mid-90s until 2009. Is transport growth decoupled from economic growth? Remember, this um, graph here is an index, and the index is 100 here. So, since the final figure here is 96.2. It means that energy consumption from transport is now slightly lower per gross domestic product unit uh, than it was uh, in year 2000. So to some extent, this has been a successful policy. But you can see some dips up here that might explain quite a bit of it. And this is the effect of the economic crisis that hit in 2008, 
and then both uh, the demand for transport and the economic growth uh, dropped. But economic growth dropped more than the demand for transport and this is the reason why this ratio got worse again. Now this is the modal split of energy consumption by transport mode and you can see that uh, uh, the dominating sector is the road transport. But what is it that's missing from, from this figure? What's missing here? Ships. There are some ships. A small wedge here called domestic navigation. That's only inland uh, transport mainly. A little bit of coastal transport. So the short sea shipping between countries in Europe is not part of the statistics. And that goes for most of the statistics that we see. So that would be much more visible than, than uh, in this graph. Okay, uh, developments in uh, this respect. Still, uh, short sea shipping is not part of it, but you can look at which, which mode is it that has a growing uh, energy consumption. Aviation and road, yeah. But rail has a declining, this is the overall, this is not per unit, but the overall emission or, or consumptions. And uh, so this also reflects changes in the volume of these models. This is a slightly more complicated graph of this decoupling thing. Um, if nothing happened to the ratio between transport demand, transport volumes and gross domestic product, then we would follow these, this 45 degree line, which is supposed to be here. Now, these are individual countries in European Union. And the ones above this line has actually had uh, a worsening of this. The, it means that they have more transport per economic unit, per GDP unit, than they used to have. This is the change between 2000 and 2009. And these countries have improved. And a few countries, mainly just Germany, has... Uh, um, had what they call absolute decoupling here, which means that uh, um, they have had a reduction in, in transport volumes and an increase in uh, financial um, uh, numbers. Okay, so one of the aims was to choose the most environmentally friendly mode of transport. Um, what is your major impression from this? development here. Has there been a lot of change in modal split, the volumes by transport mode? Very little has happened. If anything, road has even gotten stronger. Uh, the inland waterway and the rail is more or less stable, slightly on the decline. And this is by country. And here you can see the, the blue bit is uh, the uh, road sector. And uh, it's a bit hard to tell apart the rail and inland waterways here. But you can see that some countries are completely without rail and inland waterway. But that's only the small islands of Cyprus and Malta. But uh, quite a lot of other countries have a very big share of road transport. But then you have countries like the Netherlands, for instance. Not so surprising that they have a, quite a big share of inland waterway transport. Right. Um, transport volume um, by GDP uh, has generally uh, in, uh, measured in the numbers of ton kilometers has been on the decline lately 
which might be good. But does it mean that decoupling has actually happened? Have they been successful in trying to get economic growth without just as big growth in transport volumes? You could say this is again an index with 2000 as 100. What is it that happened? What has happened here? Could you say that this means that the policy has been successful or not? Or could there be other explanations why they have managed to reduce the transport intensity? What is it that happened here? Sorry? Yeah, you, you, you have had a steady increase in both transport volumes and in the economy. But then, what happened here? The economic crisis, financial crisis, right? So you had a very significant drop in transport volumes, which was more dramatic than the drop in the economy. And this is mainly what has happened. So the decoupling that seems to have taken place here may be just a temporary thing pertaining to the economic crisis rather than a policy, that the policy has been successful. If we measure greenhouse gas emissions, uh, it's more or less the same story. Um, uh, a steady increase, uh, but then a decrease following the um, financial crisis. But this is on the decline. Remember we talked about in the last hour the uh, environmental problems that has been uh, falling or being reduced over the years. This is one of them. This is the emissions of nitrogen oxides over the last couple of decades. Why is this on the decline? Any idea? Why this is falling? It's mainly to do with road transport. What has happened over these 20 years with road transport technology? Yeah, in what way has it gotten better? Okay, it could be better utilization, but I'm not quite sure that's the problem. That's the explanation. It's more about technology. Why have these emissions dropped? Uh, yeah, it's partly related to fuel, more low sulfur fuels, but uh, that's mainly with the sulfur emissions. This is nitrogen oxides. And there are two, two different things, technology-wise. One thing is that the engine generations have had to have stricter and stricter uh, um, standards. But then you also introduced, for passenger cars, you introduced something called the catalytic converter. But this, is, this was in the mid-90s. It became compulsory. And that one takes care of quite a lot of the toxic substances from passenger cars. Now, this is uh, particle emissions. Particles is uh, damaging to people's health um, and uh, could cause uh, respiratory problems and, and other things. This has also been slightly on the decline and the reason for that is also to do with engine generations and the introduction of particle filters on diesel cars. And these are, there are two fractions of these particles, slightly bigger ones, and, uh, and the smaller particles has been dropping more significantly. So this was sort of the background for the status of uh, the environmental uh, situation in, in Europe. Now let's look more specifically on, on a few uh, figures 
related to to sea transports. It's this what's not very much focused in the in the statistics. We know that seaborne trade has increased dramatically over the last decades, and then uh, we know the these pat sailing patterns. Uh, from a European perspective, you can see that Central Europe has the highest intensity of routes. Um, and this is what we call the impact pathway approach. Here are the major emissions to air from shipping. It's about CO2, as you mentioned in your mind maps, NOx, sulfur, soot or particles, uh, and uh, a number of organic substances. Now, it's one thing to look at the direct emissions. This is what we'll focus on mainly today. But in order to talk about impacts, we need to go all the way down here through what is called the impact pathway approach. Meaning that we need to model how these emissions are taken up in the local environment. And then uh, find out how this will affect, for instance, climate change or the local um, uh, air quality, for instance. Here is um, a reconstruction of the CO2 emissions from ships worldwide. You can see that uh, the increase over the last decade has been uh, dramatic. Um, if you look at the uh, world CO2 emissions, there are some different uh, estimates on how much is related to international shipping. Uh, the estimates usually are between 2 and 4 percent. Here you can add these two and uh, you will end up slightly more, more than 3 percent. Now, if you look at uh, CO2 emissions from, from transport modes on the world scale, you can see uh, uh, this distribution. You will see that road transport has the highest proportion. Um, but shipping is quite significant. And the international share of it is also uh, very big. Aviation is, is quite significant compared to the number of ton kilometers or passenger kilometers that they produce. And uh, this one is growing much faster than the other ones. Now, the reason why we have environmental problems uh, from shipping is uh, quite uh, related to this uh, pro problem of heavy fuel oils, which uh, are almost like, well, it's not asphalt, but it's a very heavy oil product with a lot of sulfur in it. And that's the major part of the fuel consumption of, of shipping. This is what has happened uh, to the fuel efficiency of vessels. Um, the uh, solid curve here, we had quite a significant increase in the efficiency in the first in the 1970s, but then the development has been more limited. This happened mainly due to a very sharp increase in oil prices back in the 70s. This is the way um, the modal uh, performance with respect to CO2 is normally presented in, uh, in policy papers. This particular one is from MERSC, a publication that they, they produced a couple of years ago. And it shows sort of the ranges of CO2 emissions per ton kilometer. And you can see that uh, the aeroplane is definitely the, the ones with the highest proportion. Um, but if you compare the three most used modes for freight transport, you will see that they are to some degree overlapping. But not surprisingly, MERSC uh, also presents this as, as shipping is, is the one with the lowest CO2 emissions. And that is probably true for a big vessel like this one but it could be questioned for smaller vessels, which we'll come back to. Trains has a very uh, wide range because uh, some of the trains are electrified and they, if this is produced mainly through green modes, uh, green uh, um, production technologies, it will be very low. And then trucks, 
um, estimated between 60 and 150 uh, in this case. Oh, I'm getting a call as well. This is great. Um, okay. Now, this is what has happened to the different engine generations of, uh, of the trucks in Europe. Uh, you have had similar developments in other parts of the world, but uh, some emissions have fallen quite significantly. Uh, but CO2 emissions up here has not been affected very much, but uh, NOx, for instance, has had a dr very dramatic drop uh, in uh, uh, this period. Now, we'll uh, illustrate uh, the performance by mode by a few concrete cases. And the first one is uh, something that I made for an article a few years ago, looking at uh, different ways of bringing cargo from mid-Norway, where we are living, to, to Paris in Central Europe. And basically, here we have four, five different ways of bringing this cargo to Europe. Um, there is one which is the pure road, case number four, and that goes through southern Sweden, uh, across the new bridge in Denmark, and, uh, and through Germany, and uh, down to Paris, and just using the road alternative. As you can see, that's a slight deviation. You have to uh, drive around Sweden here, but uh, it's, it's pretty straight. Then the alternatives are uh, the current ones are you could uh, go to uh, Oslo and take the Oslo uh, Kiel ferry, which is the solid line here, and then the road for the rest of the trip. So that's the one that's called the road and medium ferry. And then you have another existing one, which is what I've called, um, uh, no, sorry, the road and high speed ferry, number five which is to drive all the way to the southernmost part in Norway to Kristiansand and a short ferry connection, a high fairly high-speed one, uh, over to Denmark, and then the rest is road transport. Then you have two alternatives which are non-existing at the moment, but which has been proposed, and that is to take it uh, via a neighbor town to the north, Kristiansund, and over to Scotland, uh, and then on a second ferry, which would then make it the two long ferry case, from Scotland to uh, um, Belgium, and then to, to Paris. And the, second, and the last option is to, to take it to Scotland, but then drive uh, through England, and then uh, the short ferry Dover-Calais, which is the long and short ferry case. So these are five different ways of bringing the cargo to Paris, and the aim is to look at the CO2 emissions for each of those. Now, I won't go into detail in the, in the calculations, but it's quite a lot of factors that you need to consider when you do a comparative study like this. Some of them pertaining to the vessel, some to the, the case and the roads and the stretches. And then you need, in this case, it's a, there's a model being used for modeling the, the uh, emissions. Now, we also need to look in order to end up with calculations per ton, we need also to look at the actual average payload utilization or the load factor of uh, the trucks and also the load factor of the vessel. And the distances in this case are not very different. If you look at the total out here, uh, they are quite similar. Some of them are slightly longer than the others, but they differ quite a bit with how much sea transport is involved. So the most sea transport intensive one is case number two, with the two long ferries. And then you have the pure road case as the other extreme. Now, calculating the primary en energy consumption in this case actually means that um, and then we calculate it by uh, per metric ton of cargo. And uh, it's actually the road transport which has the lowest energy use here. Um, 
the uh, vessels uh, use quite a lot of, of fuel in, in this case and have two low load factors in order to compete. And then the CO2 emissions would pretty much follow that picture with a slightly even more extreme uh, outcome. And this is pretty surprising to many and I've got some angry reactions from uh, some sea operators from, uh, for this figure. Um, because it, uh, it shows in this case that the CO2 emissions are smallest for the road case. Um, pretty close for case number five, but that is because it has a very short ferry connection. The longer ferry connections, they perform badly in this uh, exercise. Now, we could calculate this either per ton transported or per ton kilometer. And the question is, why would that give a different answer in this case? And not very different, but somewhat different. What is the difference of calculating per ton or ton kilometer here? What could be the, the reason why they are different? Or to put the question in another way, when would these be identical? Any ID? The difference is obviously the, the length here. And when you look at uh, the map that we had, these were slightly longer ones. So this means that when we calculate by uh, ton kilometer, uh, we uh, get a lower uh, emission factor. If you look at NOx emissions, the, the story gets even worse from uh, a shipping perspective. Um, because of the heavy fuel oil usage, um, which has now been, this was made before the latest restrictions. Uh, so it's improved a little bit, but here you can see that uh, the, the shipping legs are really performing badly compared to the, the road. That also goes for the sulfur, uh, very high emission levels uh, from, from the ferries compared to road transport. And then I've added a graph which I call load factor sensitivity. We have here assumed load factors. So, um, the base scenario, the figures that we've seen, they are based on a 70% load factor. Um, but we could have alternative scenarios for the load factor of, of the vessel. This means that 70% of the deck space is uh, uh, filled on average with trucks and cars. And you can see that, uh, of course, if you can uh, fill the vessel better, 85%, then uh, the shipping alternatives are more competitive versus uh, the road alternative. Now, uh, because these are combined row, um, trans freight transport and passenger vessels, we have also allocated different uh, parts of the emissions to, uh, to freight and parts of it to um, uh, passenger traffic. And, uh, this will also, of course, affect the calculations, but even when you do a very favorable calculation from the shipping point of view, allocating only 20, 30 and 40 percent to the freight bit, they still do not compete apart from case number five. But the speed is more important. In the base scenario, they are more or less working on full speed. If they reduce uh, the speed, then uh, they get more competitive versus the road transport. This, again, is taken from a major policy paper published by uh, before an, a UN meeting, uh, the Mar uh, Marine Environment Protection Committee of the IMO. And this is, the blue ones here are the performance of the vessels, and then the green is rail, and the orange is road transport. And from this figure, 
you would think that uh, ships always would outperform road transport. Um, my findings are, in this case, uh, that uh, the, um, uh, the, the arrows are missing a little bit, but the row row vessels that we have looked at, they would typically have higher emissions and uh, the road transport would have lower than what's in this figure. So some conclusions from the first case here, uh, which is based on row packs ferries. We need to assume very favorable presumptions for the Ropax shipping mode to make it competitive versus the road transport. They would need to have a very high load factor, filling the vessel very much. They, it would help if they have a distance advantage, meaning that the sea leg is shorter than the road. Um, they, if they use low sulfur bunkers, or abatement technology, cleaning technology, uh, that would certainly help. And among all, uh, above all, if they do some slow steaming, which they typically do these days, uh, that will also be helpful. Now, um, case B is then a collection of typical European short sea connections. Um, this is uh, a number of uh, uh, hypothetical transport links that uh, I've uh, calculated along with a Swedish colleague from the Swedish Environmental Institute. They have a model called the NTM model uh, for doing these calculations. We've looked at two uh, transport distances from Gothenburg, one to Edinburgh in Scotland, which is definitely giving the sea uh, an advantage because the alternative by road would be to go all the way around here. Then from Gothenburg to Rotterdam, not, not so much a sea distance advantage. From Bremen in Germany to Le Havre in France. And then from Helsinki, which is slightly out of the map here in Finland, to Genoa in Italy. Here the road would have the distance advantage because the sea alternative would have to go all the way around Spain and Gibraltar and come up again. So, um, these are the distances and you can see that in the first case, Gothenburg, Aberdeen, definitely the sea has the shortest route. In the bremen Liao case, more distances are more or less the same. Helsinki, Genoa, uh, the sea leg has a disadvantage and then the Gothenburg Rotterdam is not so different. Now we've calculated CO2 emissions from based on this NTM model. Um, we have assumed some load factors for uh, the vessels based on a project called the clean shipping project uh, and then emissions factors from the Artemis project uh, and then assumed a conversion factor between dead weight tonnage and payload. Now, the first graph here shows uh, NOx, sulfur, particles and CO2 emissions for the land-based modes in the Gothenburg to Rotterdam case. Remember this was a case where you had a slight C advantage. And you can see for the CO2 emissions, the black ones here, that the truck has the highest emissions uh, than diesel train and electric train with what is called EU25 mix. That means that we assume that the electricity is produced as it is in the 25 EU countries at um, that time. The winner by among the land-based modes is definitely the electric train with 31.7 uh, uh, tons per shipment. Now, uh, here are the different ships involved in the study. A quite big shuttle tanker, um, 125,000 tons, typical for the tankers that go from the North Sea uh, installations to shore. And then a container feeder of 6,000 tons, and then a row row, pure row row vessel this time, not the row packs. And you can see that the winner is definitely the tanker 
that's the biggest vessel, uh, which has sort of one-tenth of the CO2 emissions of uh, the train again. And then container feeder and then row row is more or less on par with the train, but still significantly less than the truck. Yeah, this is the truck performance with respect to CO2, so you can see all the vessels beat the truck in this case. Helsinki to Genoa, that's uh, the case where road has the distance advantage. Uh, and if we look at just the maritime modes and versus the road, in this case, road has the distance advantage and therefore beats the row row vessel and is pretty close to beating the container vessel, but not the tanker. This is the most neutral case, Bremen to uh, Le Havre, the very small distance differences. And uh, again, focusing on CO2, you will see that um, uh, the, the truck has uh, the highest one among the land-based modes, and if you put the truck emissions here on the ships, you will see that the ships have significantly lower emissions. Okay, Gothenburg to Aberdeen, the, the vessels have a big uh, distance, difference, uh, distance advantage and therefore are much better than the truck. But in all of these, this only goes for CO2 emissions. With emissions to sulfur and NOx, the trucks are doing better uh, than the other modes apart from the electric train. So, um, if we look at it, uh, the final slide here, uh, per ton kilometer and not for, for the case, this is the overall situation. If we again focus on the CO2 emissions, you will see that the truck in this case ends up with 63 grams. Uh, where you have trains of uh, four, uh, or 43 and 24, and then uh, the different vessels here, ranging from the tanker with the very low uh, emissions of, of 37, uh, no, sorry, the tanker of, of four, and the container feeder of 37, and the row row vessel of 53. But you can see that the, the uh, truck and the row row vessel is not that different. If you look at the other emissions, this, the sea alternatives are definitely doing worse than the land-based ones. So conclusions from this case. Short sea shipping operations may deserve a green label in this case, but uh, and this is uh, with what we call realistic operating environments. Um, the row row, though, is quite marginal and uh, dependent on the market situation and how well you can fill the vessel. The size of the vessel is quite important, and here we have looked at a, a large feeder vessel, uh, and uh, smaller vessels would have a harder case to uh, compare to the truck. But when we look at the other Emission factors, sulfur, NOx, and particles, um, it's the other way around. Then shipping the definitely don't deserve a green label. Uh, and there are some, we've seen in the, in the past lectures, that there are some new regulations coming. And that might help a little bit, but you really need to switch fuel uh, or install abatement technologies in order to compete with the trucks. Uh, with respect to these emissions. Okay, um, the last case is based on a pallet vessel, um, but um, it's uh, a rather long case, so although it's five minutes early, let's uh, break for uh, 15 minutes and meet again at 10 minutes past, and then we'll do the last bit of this. Thank you.